Okay, so I've got this side all prepped and ready for the primer. I taped off all the edges around the backsplash tile, taped the plastic all along here, and I put a duct tape reinforcement over the top. So I used painter's tape to tape the plastic to the cabinets, and then I used duct tape over the top of that to make sure that we have good, good contact and a good seal so nothing's gonna drip down behind that. I sanded off all the hard corners here on the laminate, on the top edge and on the bottom edge. So that's very important. You wanna get this rounded out as well as this bottom edge rounded out because you wanna have the epoxy be able to just flow over the edge and if it's completely square, it, it, it wants to dam up right here. It won't flow over that edge. Same as at the bottom. If this bottom is not rounded out, it won't just drip off. It'll pull up right here on the edge and you'll get a bead of epoxy pulled up right here, which you'd have to sand later or live with. So make sure you sand the bottom of the laminate rounded just a bit and the top of it rounded just a bit fix any imperfections. There was a crack right here in the laminate and I bondoed that um, and sanded that. And um, just make sure there's not anywhere in the back or anywhere where epoxy could seep through because it will. If there's an opening, the epoxy will find its way through it. So make sure everything is sealed up. Um, let me bring you in closer and show you how these edges look close up in comparison to ones that have not been sanded. Here's the sanded corners. So you can see that the um, I sanded these corners, this corner right here, all the edges, and the bottom. And let me bring you to the other side of the room where I have not yet sanded, and I'll show you the difference. So this is the other side of the room where I haven't sanded anything because the sink's still got to come out. Once that comes out, I'll take a razor blade and remove all the silicone caulking that goes around the sink, but you see how the edges are completely square. That's the difference between the sanded and not sanded. So after everything is sanded down, you have to get all that sand off of there. And I like to just use a damp cloth and then go over it at the end with my hand so you can feel when it's all gone. And now it's primer time, so you need to tape your roller so that you can get all the loose lint off there. And it's not a bad idea to go ahead and do that a couple times so you don't end up with lint in your primer, although you are going to give your primer a, a light sanding after it's completely dry. So if there is any lint in there, you, you can get it out at that point. So make sure that your primer is mixed up real well. And start by cutting in your edges with a small brush. You probably want to use a, a decent quality brush so that you're not left with bristles on your countertop, um, but a chip brush will do in a pinch. And you want to put your primer on in a light coat, so don't go too heavy with the primer. Just put it on in a light coat. So I did not do any paint tray or anything. I just poured a little puddle of the primer onto the countertop and rolled it on and I only did one coat of primer and then after the primer dried for three hours I did one coat of my base coat and I used a color that we selected from my paint deck that was similar to one of the lighter colors in the backsplash tile. So after three hours I painted on the same way painted on the base coat. Okay so now I've got this high binding primer on here and I bought this from Stone Coat Countertops although you can get it from a high bonding primer from Sherwin-Williams or a couple other places, but this is the stone coat high bonding primer that I used. And you see it doesn't give you a real solid coat. You wanna put it on in a light coat, so don't put it on too thick. And then this needs to dry for, I think it says three hours on the can, so. We'll move on to the other side while this is drying and prep this side now.
Okay, so I'm gonna walk you around my job here a minute and just give you some tips and pointers. So this is the part that I just showed that was green yesterday. I came today, the base coat was on, or the primer was on, the base coat was on, it dried overnight, and I came back today and put on the epoxy. The way that I do it is I pour my epoxy clear and then I use the spray paints in buckets like this. So I put each color into its own bucket, or that's how I did it this time anyway, into its own bucket with a paint stick. There's my other two colors. I'm gonna show you around my workspace. It's kinda, it's very messy right now because I just finished this side over here where the sink is. I just finished pouring that, so I'm gonna have to go around and wipe the drips here in just a sec. Definitely, if you're thinking of doing this, Get yourself a roll of this paper, the rosin paper that they sell in the paint department because you'll want to go ahead and roll out as you're working. If you have a large area like this, you'll wanna roll out new sheets of paper as your feet get sticky to keep your workspace manageable. So I did this. Um, and you can see I have, I had quite a bit of vertical surfaces here and there's not a whole lot that you can do with that, except it, let it run. It, it's gonna run down to your top, but that's just the way it is. You just have to keep an eye on it and make sure that you don't get any sagging or dripping in the epoxy. So you've gotta keep a box of gloves. So that's my other recommendation is get yourself a box of gloves i've got 80 gloves here and a little thing of powder and set yourself up with like 20 pairs of powder just drop a little bit of powder in each glove so that they're ready for you because you're going to want to be taking your gloves on and off constantly i've probably today gone through 40 gloves or more myself so that's a huge tip is have your gloves on hand a lot of them and then the powder because your hands will be sweaty in them and trying to get a new set of gloves on is nearly impossible when your hands are wet so then here's the other part next to the stove and notice i used white tape to tape the backsplash just in case a piece of it gets locked into the epoxy, you won't even see it. And then the part by the sink, make sure that you tape off real well your plastic. So I used, I think seven mil plastic. So it's a little bit thicker than I think one or two. I don't know, I used medium thickness on plastic. I taped it on with painter's tape and then I came over the painter's tape with the duct tape to make sure that there wasn't any voids or anything where any epoxy could seep through, particularly above the dishwasher. I went right, I stuck the tape in between there so that it was all the way back in there and so nothing could run in there. So I'm gonna have to get my gloved hand on, get those drips. And then you'll see my vertical surface there. I'll come in a little bit closer. And you'll see how it runs, but that's the best that can be done. I think it still looks good. It looks a little bit runny, but I think it still looks pretty good. I'm gonna take you around the other side and show you this part on the bar because it looks really good. So we're on the other side of the kitchen and this is the high top bar and this part. And now mind you, this is only the first coat of epoxy. So there are some voids and some dimples in the epoxy but that's what the second coat does for you. It really smooths it out, so it's smooth as glass after the second coat. And I like to put the white on last because it, it um, the white separates in a way that the other colors don't. I don't know why that is. So this will set overnight, and in the morning I will come in and do a light sanding with a 200 grit sandpaper and then apply a second coat. But the idea with, with this was for it to be color similar to the tumbled marble backsplash that I put in previously. All right, so I'm doing my second pour today. Um, I did this all this epoxy yesterday. So today I am 
about to, uh, mixing up my first batch of epoxy to do the second pour. A couple things that I thought of, if you're doing a kitchen or an area where you've got a few different places or separate, separate spots, you want to pour them separately so that you're not, so it's not a race against the clock to get your design on there before it starts to harden. Okay, thank you. So that was my five minute timer. I mix it with my paddle and then I, halfway through, uh, at three minutes, I mix it three minutes with my paddle and then I do two minutes with, with a paint stick to let the air bubbles settle out of it and make sure that I've got the sides scraped and the bottom scraped. And then I still use my trowel and scrape it and mix it on the countertop when I pour it just in case. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to say was if you've got separate areas like I have, do it in, don't try to pour like this whole area and the area next to the stove, do one at a time. And go ahead and get yourself a bunch of buckets or get at least a bucket for each space. So a resin bucket, a cure bucket, and then the, your mix bucket for each space so that you're not having to clean out your buckets or reuse buckets that have a little product left in it because then, you know, no matter how much you scrape, there's going to be product in there. Also, I can't remember what else, but when I think of it, I'll let you know. Okay, so this is the second day, the second pour. I already sanded and, and took all the sand, uh, res all the sand off the top of the countertops and poured my second coat. It's just clear epoxy. You mix it the exact same way. So the second pour is easier because of course you're not putting any design in there, no color or anything like that. So you just pour it, level it out. I found that the foam roller is a really great way to level it out. I do like that for the second pour because it doesn't have any trowel marks. This is my favorite vein right here, I think. So you see how that second coat really levels out and makes it look like glass, very smooth. It also adds some depth and dimension to it. So it looks like the, um, the countertop has depth, like the, the marbling is, is deep into the epoxy and it just really adds another dimension to the counter. So definitely do a second coat. This part here came out a little bit darker than the rest of the counter. So you'll want to take off the backsplash tape um, when the epoxy is still a little bit tacky. So don't wait until it's completely 100% cured to take off the back tape and use a razor knife to cut, to just score a line and then pull that tape off. It'll be a lot easier to take that off. Okay, turning back into that corner. See how nicely the colors go with the backsplash. And then the sink area, which another vertical surface there that came out pretty decent. So this kitchen was a little bit complicated because of the vertical surfaces and the overhang of the bar, the different levels. If you just have a one level, all your counters are one level, um, it's a lot easier um, because you don't have to do it in so many different steps. So if you're thinking about doing this um, epoxy on your laminate countertops, go for it. You won't regret it. It's, um, it seems daunting, but it's actually easier than you think. So if you want a little bit more details on how to do the epoxy and the design part and the mixing of the epoxy, I have much more um, basic details on my first epoxy video that I did in my kitchen and I will link to that here. I'll put um, an end screen um, card up for you so you can just click on that link. You see how shiny? Wow, like glass. Um, so yeah, check out that next video. I'll, I'll actually put up two videos. I have a prepping for epoxy if you're doing epoxy over MDF, if you're putting down your own MDF, and then the uh, basically epoxy basics here. So check those videos out next.